everyone, I'm Danielle O'Gorman, uh, and today I'm here to talk to you about um, disadvantages. So this is the introduction to disadvantages lecture. It's going to be best for you if you have limited experience with debate. So if you have no debate experience or just a little bit of debate experience, or if you just want a quick review of terminology before moving on to one of the more advanced lectures on the topic. So let me share my screen with you. Ooh. Ooh, fancy. Okay. Uh, so disadvantages. What is a disadvantage? A disadvantage is a chain of events caused by the plan that culminates in something bad. So probably really, really bad. We're talking like a war, some other path to extinction, human extinction, or, you know, the world extinction. It's an effective negative tool because it doesn't require you to 100% take out or turn the affirmative's harms or advantages. It creates sort of an external effect of the plan that is bad, um, that is outside of the effects that the affirmative claims. Uh, and that's good because probably the affirmative is going to be really, really up on the literature of what the plan does and how it um, fixes a problem. But the, um, the negative, right, gets to sort of create this external issue with the plan that can be very strategically helpful. Um, so Typically, a disadvantage relies on a fairly generic link to the plan. The plan takes an action um, that is sort of generally lumped in with most of the actions under the topic. That sounds bad, right? But actually, it's pretty good because it means the disadvantage is a very flexible tool in the negatives toolbox. That it, it is useful against almost any um, topical affirmative. So the first component of a disadvantage is uniqueness. Um, and uniqueness is a description of the status quo. So it describes what the world is like right now. Um, so if you're looking at the, the federalism disadvantage that came out in the starter set, you would see that the uniqueness evidence is like the state's control over uh, policing and criminal justice is very high right now, that states are in charge of that, not the federal government. And that piece of evidence argues that that is sort of the keystone of federalism, that all other federalism um, stems from state control over criminal justice mechanisms. So it's a description of the way the world is now. Right now, the states are in charge of that. The link is a description of the way the plan, the affirmative's plan, changes that status quo, right? So the um, example, again, from the starter set is the plan takes authority away from the states and centralizes that authority in the federal government. Yeah? So it's how the plan changes the status quo. The internal link, this is kind of a fuzzy category, I would say, because sometimes it's not its own separate piece of evidence or its own separate argument. It's either sort of lumped into the link argument or it's lumped into the impact argument. Um, we are lucky here that the file actually has its own kind of independent internal link argument. Um, so the one in the file that you're looking at says, that spills over, that sort of evolution of control back to or towards the federal government, centralization of control to the federal government um, spills over and is bad for our response to the coronavirus, uh, which is bad for the economy. Um, so you can imagine that there might be a piece of evidence out there that says, 
um, both the link argument and the internal link argument, that changing the way that we um, govern the police, changing the part of the government that is in control of the police spills over and makes control of the coronavirus response also be more centralized, right? It makes us more comfortable with central control. Um, you can imagine that that piece of evidence might exist. Uh, and then impact, right, is that really, really, really bad thing. So we sort of push this chain of dominoes at the beginning and at the end, we get to this really bad thing. Um, as a result of the link internal link scenario. Sometimes the impact is going to have more than one piece of evidence in the 1NC because um, you're going to need it to get further out. Um, well, again, we didn't in this, in this shell. Uh, so this card just says that that economic collapse as a result of um, the coronavirus would go global and would ultimately result in So I guess before we get to overviews, right, you can see that there is this, it's, it's a logical chain, right? Right now the world is good, right? Right now the states are in control of lots of things that are traditionally the realm of the states. Um, that includes policing. It also includes like health and welfare. The plan shifts one of those areas of control to the federal government which would spill over and cause us to shift other things that have traditionally been in the area of the states to the federal government, like health and welfare, um, hence coronavirus response. And that's bad because the federal government being in charge would be bad for the economy, um, which would cause a global economic collapse and a big war, which would be bad. Uh, so that's that sort of chain of events that you can see. The next slide I have talks about overviews. This is a little bit of an advanced concept. Um, I would say everybody can start giving overviews, but how to like give a good overview is like maybe a little advanced. So um, these should obviously not be in the 1NC. The 1NC should tell the story exactly as it's laid out in the show. But in the 2NC or the 1 and R, you might want to start describing the argument a little bit. So one of the things that you'll do, um, you're going to start wanting to explain, if I'm the judge, you want to start explaining to me how to evaluate this argument, what I should do with it, right? Um, and I would say in the in the 2NC or the 1NR, you would want this to be a regional overview in the sense that you would want it to be right at the top of the disad flow. It doesn't have to be at the very, very beginning of the speech, right? Um, and I would say here, you want to start making comparisons, right? So our evidence says this, our evidence is very predictive on this question, our evidence responds to their evidence, it's directly responsive. Um, and you can also talk about sort of uh, what would happen if the AF passes and the disadvantage is triggered, right? Um, and I think you can also talk about impact calculus here to some extent in the 2NC, 1NR, and then in the 2NR when you're giving your sort of global overview, if this disad makes it alive to the 2NR, you can start really parsing out and weighing impacts there too. So, why a disad? Why a disadvantage? Why a DA? Why are they good? Um, they have a variety of strategic uses. Um, like we said before, right, the nice thing about introducing an external consequence of the plan is that you don't have, you're not sort of stuck with um, debating in the affirmatives world, right? So you can um, create this sort of external bad consequence of the plan and then say, look, even if the plan resolves some of the harms that they've outlined in their advantages, they trigger this other really, really bad thing to happen and that's bad and we shouldn't do it. So, um, so that disad impact can outweigh the case, right? It could also um, turn the case, right? So if in addition to this federalism argument, um, Maybe you would say that federal control of the police militarizes them because it gives them 
uh, it's, it makes them, puts them under central authority, it puts them under kind of maybe like the president's authority, like the military is, and it gives them more access to things like military weapons, military technology, military type training, and that is actually worse for the impacts that you're trying to solve um, than uh, keeping them under the sort of purview of the state. Um, and so that would be like a term to the case, right? That the plan doesn't fix the police, it makes the police worse, um, turns the case. That argument that I just described is also a net benefit to the counter plan, right? If the counter plan, so if you're looking at the federalism DA in the packet, it's not by itself, right? It's in there with the state's counter plan. And so, um, Federalism is a really good net benefit to the state's counter plan because the state's counter plan is basically going to say, instead of having the federal government do it, keep the police under the control of the state government, but do all these regulations at the state level. And so you avoid um, the impact to the disad and the case turn by doing it through the counter plan. So that's, that's how we would describe it as a net benefit to the counter plan. For some of you, I know that's very early verbiage and you're like, what's a net benefit and or what is a counter plan? We're going to get there, but just remember that disadvantages are net benefits to counter plans. So, uh, a reminder, even if you win 100% risk of your disadvantage impact, you still don't necessarily win the debate, right? You have to do something else to the AF. Right, so either you have to solve some of the affirmative's impacts with a counter plan, or you have to mitigate the case, so take out some of their solvency, or you have to turn the case, right? So say that they actually make it worse. Um, so you, it, it can't be the only part of the 2NR, let's say that. It is not always the best option against a non-traditional affirmative, so an affirmative that maybe doesn't read a plan. Um, sometimes it's not even always a great option um, or a great only option against affirmatives that do read a plan but don't claim like a nuclear war impact or like a um, sort of a body count impact. So what we would call like a soft left AF that relies on like resolving oppression, um, those kinds of things. It's not always your best best bet against those by itself. You need to make some other arguments in, com in combination with it. And if you don't read a plan, it's unclear maybe what the link would be. Um, that's also some like advanced level business that we can talk about, uh, that my lab can talk about later. And if you're curious about that, um, I would say maybe the advanced disad lecture might have some more um, tips on that or um, debating non-traditional affirmatives or like critical affirmatives might have some tips for how to sort of answer those types of things. So answering the K, um, which is an elective later on, might also have some tips there. Um, how do you, when you're affirmative, answer a disad? So the method that I always encourage my debaters to use is the TULIP method. Um, that's an acronym um, and it describes types of arguments. And I would say if you have one, at least one of each of these types of arguments in your block, um, in your 2AC block, you're in a good position. Um, so the first argument is uh, a turn, right? So the first thing you wanna try to do is turn the dissat. You can turn the disad on a variety of levels, either at the link um, or the impact level. Um, most people tend to encourage a link turn because it's a little more flexible, um, but a link turn has two components, remember. Um, so a link turn requires you to turn uh, to read uniqueness in the opposite direction, which also should maybe help you at the non-unique level of the next uh, of the U of the tulip. Um, so you need to read uniqueness to the link turn and you need to read a link turn. Um, at some level, it may be very difficult to link turn like the federalism DA, right? Because if the plan just like decentralizes authority, um, or I'm sorry, centralizes authority back to the federal government, like what do you, 
that's just true. It, that's like literally what it does. So um, a lot of people would focus maybe more on the like internal link level, which might be like federal control over coronavirus response good because it's uniform, um, which is also a link turn. It's more of a link turn than it is an impact turn. Um, but there are kind of levels of the link that you want to be responsive to. Um, and so there you would have to win um, uniqueness that like the states are in charge of coronavirus response now and it is not good. Um, and then the link level of, um, you know, the, the plan puts the federal government in control and that's better. Uh, there are also impact terms. Um, impact terms, when we traditionally think of them, we kind of traditionally think of them as like uh, economic collapse good because growth is bad, um, which is like a whole other um, lecture in and of itself. Um, but impact turning uh, is, a, is a good strategy. Um, you can't, if you're going to say growth is bad or if you're going to say like another, you know, impact turn type argument, you want to make sure that you have the cards to do that, right? You can't just be like, oh, and growth is bad, right? And you also have to make sure that it doesn't conflict with anything that you've said on the affirmative. So if you're reading like an, econo an economic advantage, you can't be like, just kidding, actually growth is terrible, right? You don't wanna like accidentally like take out the F. So, um, so you have to be careful, can't just like casually impact turn. It really has to be a strategy that you've thought through. Um, if you have, it is a very valuable tool in the arsenal. If you are ready to impact turn, impact turn, and it's awesome, but it's often a little bit easier and more flexible to link turn and design. So that's the turn component. The other components, the non-unique, the no link, the no impact, are just um, takeouts to the, um, takeouts to the uh, different components of the disadvantage itself. So if they make a uniqueness claim, you make a claim in sort of the other direction, that's like, no, the disad's non-unique. If they make a link claim, right, you're going to say, no, the link is not, or the, you know, the link is, there's no link, right? The disad doesn't sort of shift. I think that one of the sort of easiest components generally to take out is either the link or the internal link to the disad, because those are generally the weakest points of it. Um, you can also say no impact. So um, to this advantage, you could easily say like economic collapses don't trigger wars. That's empirically proven. Um, Japan had an economic collapse in the um, late 90s and it didn't trigger global war, even though they were really critical to the global economy at the time. The U.S. recession that we had in the early 2000s and the housing bubble burst that almost became a depression but and was a like really bad recession in 08, neither of those triggered like global wars. So there's no reason why like coronavirus being bad is going to trigger a war. Um, and then finally, you would say that the AF advantages outweigh. Um, so the AF is bigger. Uh, the AF, you might, if, you, if you're lucky, you might be able to say that the AF is more critical to the economy um, than the uh, DA. So just the affirmative outweighs, our, our impacts are bigger. Yeah, so that's TULIP. Um, and if you remember TULIP, also remember what the letters stand for. But if you do that and you kind of structure your two AC blocks in that way, you will always have sort of a multi-layered approach to answering a disad. So what are some types of disadvantages that you might see? Um, so you're almost always sort of regardless of what the topic is, going to see a politics disadvantage. Um, and those look differently uh, sort of across different years. Um, this year you will almost certainly see an elections disadvantage. You will almost certainly see um, a Senate election disadvantage as the uniqueness for who will win the presidency is going to sort of like be all over the place in a giant mess. And um, in a lot of years, kind of depending on what Congress looks like, you will also see a congressional or like presidential agenda um, disadvantage, which is just the, um, the plan pushes some other piece of legislation off of the agenda that's bad, uh, whatever. Uh, the federal 
capitalism disadvantage, which we've already talked about. Um, my guess is on this topic as a domestic topic, you will see a lot of discussion about economics um, in the disadvantage so in the disadvantage area. So in addition to just being an impact to federalism, you may also see an, an econ disadvantage in and of itself. And then I think there are going to be a lot of courts based disadvantages. So um, especially when you're talking about sentencing reform, so changes to the way that courts uh, sentence people is going to slow down the courts. Um, that's called a court clog. It, it makes things move more slowly through the courts as they sort of have to figure out how the new regulations work. Um, any AF that uses the court as the actor um, could see like a court's agenda or a court's politics DA. Um, which works very similarly to a um, like legislative or presidential politics DA, um, but is focused on um, like the, the Supreme Court's docket. So those are some things that you can sort of be aware of and see. And I think we will discuss those more in labs. We will discuss those more um, in electives. Um, and of course, I'm open to talking about them during Q&A, which I think is... Um, coming up. So, questions? And um, with that, yeah.